Okay, so um, we are going to get started uh, for Intro to Psychology, talking about Chapter 12, which is Social Psychology. This lecture may go a little over an hour. If it does, um, it is possible that at the hour mark it cuts off and makes me do a new video. Um, it's done that in the past, but we're going to see if it'll let us continue on. Normally for this uh, material, I do like to break it up over multiple classes and I like a lot of class participation. So it's not as fun online, but um, this should help clear up some um, important concepts. So um, if you see some people might be coming on since this is a live lecture, but remember this is recorded, um, but uh, it might be a hiccup if a person comes in and asks a question, but I do have chat up in case um, somebody has any questions. So. We're going to go into uh, social psychology. There's also a few videos that are that are associated with this material that um, I'm going to kind of point to. There are YouTube videos. They're also available on the Moodle page. But these are really good um, videos that describes the concepts really well. So <clears throat> when we talk about what social psychology is now. I want to remind you guys that every single chapter we go over is just like a giant amount of material. Um, and we do have classes that are specially um, uh, designed to go over that material in full. So like, for example, chapter 12, social psychology, we have an entire class, which I, I usually teach and, I, and I'm teaching currently, I usually teach it in the spring. Um, which is just social psychology. So we're cramming a lot of concepts and material into each chapter. And remember, it's kind of like a, um, you know, just kind of exposure to some of the concepts of the field. So it might seem like a lot, and it is a lot. And if you read the chapter, it's a really good chapter and, and really good explanations of the main concepts. But there's a lot more to social psychology than just what we're, we're presenting here. Um, but what is social psychology? So, so, so social psychology is different from sociology. Um, social psychology is all about um, the thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors um, of, of, uh, of, of a person and that can be influenced by either the presence of people or the perceived presence of people, as well as the social and physical environment. And you might ask yourself, well, what, what do you mean by the perceived presence of people? Um, and that is, how do you act when you think you're being watched? You know, um, even if there isn't somebody there, if you're standing in a mirror and you think it's a two-way mirror, um, you know, you'll act differently than if you are by yourself. You act differently if you are with a group versus if you're with a friend versus with an acquaintance versus by yourself. All of these things influence how you think, how you feel, how you behave. And so, so psychology is looking at all of those things and how that influences um, a person. And we're gonna talk about this idea of the self or sense of self. And so what this is, is this is your um, identity. Um, this is who you think you are and that's influenced by society. It's influenced by social um, people around you, by uh, culture, so your own culture as well as what culture you're exposed to, as well as the psychological experiences that you uh, personally experience. Um, there are two major areas in social psychology that we do research. One is social cognition um, and the other is social influence. So social cognition is how we look at other people, how we are able to categorize them, how do we um, inform impressions of, that, of other people and, and who they are, um, how do we understand other people's behavior in relationship to ourselves, and then how we um, create ideas about things, and how do we have, uh, how we have uh, our own behaviors affected by our attitudes of particular things. And we're gonna get into um, attitudes and attitude change here in a little bit. Um, and then the other key research area is social influence. So that's how our particular behavior is affected by people, as well as with the situation that we're in. Um, for example, social influence can explain why we behave a certain way at a funeral versus how we behave at a, a, a music uh, concert, for example. Now, when we talk about um, person perception, this is uh, what we, the process that we use in order to figure out how other people are, are, are working and, and how we form these judgments and impressions of other people. And there's, there's some key components to 
um, how we form these impressions and then how we decide to behave. So I like to use the example of public transportation for this because it seems to really work. Um, even if you uh, grew up in Wise and grew up in the Southwest Virginia where we don't tend to use a lot of public transportation here, um, you should still be able to, to kind of get the idea. Um, and if you've gone to bigger cities and you've gone on subways or trains or buses, then you'll kind of, you, you'll see where I'm going with this. So I like to think of um, kind of what, what happens when we first get on to public transportation. You know, if we're getting on a bus and the bus is full of strangers, you know, we have a lot of rules, a lot of societal rules about how, where we're gonna sit and how we're gonna behave. So experience tells us when we get on the bus, what do we do? We pay for our trip. Usually now we have cards that, um, you know, will have so many, uh, uh, so much money on it or so many trips on it or depending on what kind of system it is, you, you know, you scan the card and, you know, now you're allowed on the bus and then once you're allowed on the bus, then you have to make a decision of where you're going to sit. And so these societal rules kind of play a hand at what we're going to, uh, where we're going to decide to sit. So generally speaking, if there's no seats, you stand. If there is, um, a group of people whom you kind of relate better to, like more so your age or your type um, of people, um, your in-group, and we'll talk about in-group later, uh, people that you relate to, then you're gonna sit closer to those individuals. Um, when you look at, uh, you know, our rules for engagement. Um, if you look at a person and they have headphones in, ear, ear, um, either headphones on, or uh, earbuds in, and they're listening to uh, either their phone or you know whatever, to listening to music, and they're looking down and they're on their phone. That's a sign that usually says, "Don't talk to me, right? I'm busy. I, I don't want to engage with you." If a person is sitting there and looking around and makes eye contact with you, a lot of times, much older individuals, um, let's say like the grandmother excuse me, grandfather types, if they're, you know, maybe in their 80s and they're sitting on the bus and they're looking around, they're, you know, they may be looking to engage with somebody in conversation. If a person is looking down or looking at a newspaper, looking at a book, looking at their phone, usually that's a sign that they don't want to talk. So you may have a situation where you're on a, on a bus and you have a few open seats, okay, or you can choose to stand. You have a uh, a seat next to a little old lady who's looking at you and made eye contact immediately when you got on the bus. You have another seat next to a person who's about your age and maybe they are on their phone looking down and not, you know, they they don't want to conversate with anybody. And then you have a third option where it's a big kind of, you know, a large man and maybe he looks kind of tough and he's got like a scowl on his face. So we use these four components that we have on this slide here to sort of influence where you're gonna sit. Because if you've been on public transportation, you know that people are in a hurry, you wanna get on the bus and get your seat and, and be done with it real quick. So first you're going to, to figure out what are the characteristics of the person you're trying to evaluate? Well, We've already determined the little old lady kind of looks like a little old lady. She kind of looks like a grandma. Maybe she wants to have a conversation. You don't know this person, right? You've never met them, but you're getting these kind of stereotypes and, and you know, these ideas of how this person is going to behave. You look at the person that's more like your age and you think they probably don't want to talk um, and they are sort of in their own little bubble and they not they might not even realize that, you know, that there's a seat open next to them. And then you have this real big burly guy and maybe you think maybe he's kind of threatening and, and I'm kind of worried about that guy. Maybe he might, you know, not like me sitting next to him. So first you're going to look at your own self-perception. You're going to look at yourself in this idea. So in the case of the, the bigger guy, you might think, well, do I look like um, a threat to him? You know, maybe I'm a big guy and maybe he might think that I'm trying to threaten him. So you're going to think about yourself in this. And you're also going to think about, well, that grandmother kind of made eye contact with me. She's going to think that I want to talk if I make eye contact with her. So you're thinking about yourself in this and how you are projected on to what, what are they thinking about you? What's going on in their head? And this all happens in a blink of an eye, right? Then you're, next you're going to think about the goals in the situation. What are your goals? Do you want to sit down and have a conversation? Maybe you want to talk, sit next to the grandmother and have a, a, a talk. Maybe you don't want to talk and you want to be quiet. Maybe, you know, you don't necessarily feel threatened by the big guy and you like, Hey, I'll sit next to him, whatever. I don't, 
I don't want to sit next to the other two. So what are your goals? If your goal is to have a conversation, then it'll change your decision and where you want to sit. And then finally, the specific situation in which this, this process occurs, these are all the societal rules that are going to govern um, you know, how you act in this. Maybe there's three, uh, two seats available and you know, one is next to the big guy, one is open and then one is open next to that one. Well, societal rules might say, that you can sit on the one that's not directly next to him, but the other one, kind of like the idea of the three urinals and a man goes in and he's, you know, go, goes to one end. Do you use the one in the middle or do you use the one on the end? Well, societal rule says you use the one on the end. So there's a lot of these little, like mini little scripts, we call them, that people use to talk to each other and scenarios that we use that we don't even realize are based in societal rules that are unspoken. So all of these things, these components come in and they uh, are going to, uh, these factors are going to play into what decision you're going to make based off the impressions that you've made of these people that you've never met before and how you're going to, to, uh, to, to, to determine what you're going to do. It could be that the grandma doesn't want to have a conversation with you and she's just looking around. It could be that the person with their headphones in wants to have a conversation as soon as you sit down, pulls them out and talks to you. It could be that you know, that big burly guy that seems kind of like, you know, a big threatening person could actually be the sweetest person in the whole world and just so happens to have a resting face that isn't, you know, um, inviting. So the problem is, is that we have to very quickly navigate our environment. We have to very quickly decide things like where we're going to sit in public transportation, what we're going to do, how we're going to approach that, who we're going to talk to. And so these, these conceptions that we have are, are instantaneous. These are things that we have categorized and quickly put together so that we are able to look at somebody and go, do I want to engage with them? Do I don't? Do I want to ignore them? Do I want to avoid them? Do I want to talk with them? Should, do I want them to be my next best friend? All of these things uh, factor into our forming of our impressions and they, and they happen in split seconds um, because we need to act quickly. So in order to do that, sometimes we're right, right? Maybe the big brother guy is mean. And sometimes we form these conceptions and we're, we're incorrect. So it's important though to know the process. And this idea of categorization, this is how we place people in categories. Now, I'm going to say this in a way that I don't want this to come off as this is a good thing or a bad thing. This is just a thing that we do. When we talk about cognition or the way that we think, the way that we form language, the way that we um, form ideas, and the way that we develop over time from infancy to adulthood, we just automatically, our brains are um, developed in such a way that we categorize this information immediately. Um, and so any information. And so when we think about learning how, for example, um, to understand language, let's say uh, dogs, cats, birds, animals, okay? When we are very young, we learn that there are all these animals in the world, but then we have to sort of decide where they all go. We have to kind of put them in boxes in our head. And so we look at a dog and go, okay, there's a dog, it's got teeth, it's got four legs, or there's a horse. And so we might combine all animals with four legs into one category, but then as we start to learn more about dogs and cats and horses and cows, we go, wait a second, these are all different. These all belong in their own categories. And then we, you know, look at dogs and we go, okay, the, the category is dog. And then you learn that there's collies, there's chihuahuas, there's boxers, there's um, beagles. There's all these different kinds of dogs. Well, now there's this big category and there's all these little separate categories into big dogs and furry dogs and um, short haired dogs and long haired dogs and, you know, giant dogs like Great Danes and tiny dogs like Chihuahuas. And we learn to categorize the more we learn about things, the more we categorize them into smaller and smaller boxes. So we do the same thing with people. We meet people from different areas. Maybe we meet people from you know, higher north, we meet people from further south, we meet people out west, we meet people from Africa, from countries in Africa, we meet people from New Zealand, and we box them all together. We meet white people and black people and Asian people and, you know, um, Hispanic people and all sorts of different people, and we, we box them all up into different categories. And so we can do this consciously, right, which we refer to as explicit, 
This is explicit cognition where we learn, okay, these are the people, these are the names, these are the categories. And then we also do this implicitly. So there, there are every single person in the whole wide world does this. And, and a lot of people say, well, I'm not, you know, racist and I'm not this and that. It's not about being racist. It's not about that. It's, it's simply knowing that we all experience implicit cognition where we have certain things that we've learned over time and that we implicitly or inside, we, we immediately think about those things without being able to say it. So it's implicit, it's internal, it's something that we have learned and it's almost like a feeling that we get or you know something that we can't quite put into words. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about implicit um, processes in just a minute, but know that every single person does this. And we learn these implicit associations from you know really from infancy and we start to to gather these as we get you know as we develop over time now the idea that you know we all and and other people that category that are categorized share traits share behaviors the idea behind this is called implicit personality theory and that is that there are certain groups of people that share these characteristics and that's sort of how we learn to form impressions and, and, and associations of people as we develop now one thing that we've talked about in the past or at least it's been in your book i'm not sure if i've actually done a lecture on this but this idea of a schema a schema is something that you create that's a group of ideas. So like um, when you think of a movie theater, you have a schema for movie theater. When I, when I say a classroom, you have a schema for classroom. Um, and so what's in that schema is going to be dependent upon what you've been exposed to, um, what classrooms you've been exposed to. So if you've uh, been at a really large university um, where you know a typical class might be a 100 to 300 students, I say a classroom, you might think of like a big, um, uh, uh, auditorium with lots of chairs and lots of pull-out desks and you know five different um, projectors that that you can look at screens whereas you know if you've been to a smaller college maybe when I say classroom you think of a small classroom of 30 desks with a dry erase board um, you know schema previously was a chalkboard um, for classroom when I say movie theater if you've been to a big city that has like a movie theater that will serve you dinner, okay, that's going to be a different um, schema than, you know, if you grew up somewhere else or if you're exposed to something else. I'll give you guys an example of uh, the first time I ever went to the Pinnacle in Bristol and discovered the reclining movie theater seats, my schema changed dramatically and I never, you know, I, I always expect that now when I go into a theater and I don't get that. I get angry. I'm like, I want a reclining um, seat. But, um, so, you know, our schemas will constantly change and develop based on what we're exposed to. But when I say, what do you think of when you think of this, that is your schema. And then a part of that is something called a script. So this is typically what you say to other people that's kind of an, almost an unwritten rule. This is sort of societal script. So if I walk up to a person, a complete stranger in a store, and I say, hi, how are you? Most of the time their answer is, I'm fine, how are you? Um, if you, you know, say, to somebody, you know, have a good day, they usually will say things like, thank you, have a good day as well. Or if you say, how do you think the weather is, they'll kind of, you know, stick to that script. And that's usually how it goes. So when we have these things, these are things that are sort of dictated by our culture. These are things that are dictated by what we know. And another schema that we have that we attribute to people is something called attractiveness. Um, what is beautiful is good. So this idea of attractive people tend to be more intelligent. They tend to be happier, better adjusted. Now, of course, we all have examples of people who aren't these things, who are really pretty and they're stuck up and they're mean and all that. But what we find in studies is that people who are attractive also tend to have things like higher self-esteem. They tend to be more intelligent. They tend to have more desirable traits like kindness, generosity, um, than people of more average appearance. And so the question is, is, well, does that mean that people who are more attractive have it all? That genetically, if you're going to be more attractive, you're just going to be better overall. You're just going to be a better person. That turns out it's actually not the case. What we find is it's specifically culture, something we, we, we refer to as the self-fulfilling prophecy. When you treat somebody who is more attractive a certain way, 
um, treat them like they're more intelligent, treat them like they're better, give them more affection, give them more attention, then what happens is they develop these more desirable traits because of that attention. So our culture it actually influences these schemas into self-fulfilling prophecies. I'll give you an example that's really, um, it's, it's kind of sad, but it's really interesting. And what it is, is it's, um, there have been studies that have been done on, for example, like Russian orphanages and, and, and um, infant studies. Um, and there, there's been a lot of these different studies all over, but one in particular looked at newborn babies. And what they did is they rated the newborns based off of attractiveness, like how cute was the baby. And they found that the more attractive the baby, the more attention the nurses were giving the babies. And so they were actually picking them up more, they were changing their diapers more, they were giving them better care, they were giving them more affection. So from day one, from the day that you're born, if you're more attractive, you're gonna be given more attention by you know, people around you. Um, and so because they're given more favorable treatment from parents, teachers, employers, peers, et cetera, you know, the idea is, is that they feed into this, this, um, this uh, the more desirable traits and they actually develop those because of the, the increased intention. So our schemas can be slightly flawed, um, but, and, and probably culturally derived um, and driven. But what's interesting is that we do categorize people based off of these, these particular uh, ideas. Now, another big part of social psychology is this idea of attribution. So this is essentially is um, how do you determine the cause of a person's behavior as well as explaining your own behavior. And what we tend to do is try to insulate ourselves. So I'll give you guys an example, and a lot of people hate this example, but it's very true. When we talk about things like school shooters, somebody who has gone into their workplace and shot a bunch of people, when somebody goes into a school and shoots a bunch of children, when somebody goes and um, sets off a bomb in a, in a, in a place um, uh, or murders a bunch of people, the first thing we say is, oh my goodness, they are crazy. There's something wrong with them. They are not normal. It turns out that a lot of times those people tend to be normal. They're fine. They're not abnormal. It could just be that they had a bad situation and it's internally they're normal, but they just had so many things go against them that they ended up just sort of breaking. And so we can think of like, a person who has been bullied, the person, you know, you know, mentally they may be fine. They're not crazy. They're not, you know, sick. They're not, there's nothing wrong with them, but maybe they were bullied. Um, and then maybe, you know, they had a relationship that broke up. Maybe their parents said something to them, or maybe they lost their job, or maybe they lost their house or their children. And all of this piles up and everyone has a breaking point. Everyone has a point at which they say, I'm done, it's over. And then they sort of go into this, this period where they, you know, shut down. Some people, it's a violent, aggressive behavior. Other people, they shut down internally and then they don't do anything, but they harm themselves or they, you know, sort of, you know, uh, decide that they don't want to, you know, be, they, they either might kill themselves or hurt themselves or they may sort of regress away. Now, when we as a society look at these people, we don't like to think that. We don't like to think, well, that's a normal person who just had a bad break. And the reason is, is because of the psychological insulation. It's very uncomfortable to think that could have been me. If it would just been the right circumstances, I could have been that person standing there. Or if the person is um, a victim of something like a heinous crime, a rape, something like that, you, you like the collective you society, tends to blame the person, which we refer to as victim blaming, which we'll get to in a minute. And that insulates the person from feeling uncomfortable and thinking that could have been me. Because in most of these situations, there isn't anything that is going to, to, you know, to really um, insulate you other than the comforting thought, they did something wrong and it, you know, and it, and it definitely couldn't have been me. When we talk about how to explain these behaviors away, okay, um, we insulate ourselves in many different ways. One is the fundamental attribution error. So when we think of people who are doing things that people that we don't know, strangers, we like to think that whatever they're doing is because of internal or personal characteristics. So we attribute their behaviors to an internal reason 
okay? Ignoring the external situation, ignoring situational factors. So I like to give the example of you're driving down the street and somebody jumps out in front of you. I'm talking like from nowhere, miles behind you, there's nobody driving behind you. There's you know nobody in front of you, it's just you on the road. And then somebody pulls out in front of you and it makes you slam your brakes. Usually what you're gonna do, <laughs> and I've asked many people, so I know that this is a very common occurrence, uh, and a common uh, reaction is usually you, you get angry, right? You might curse at the person, give them the finger. You might go, that person's just a big jerk. They are inconsiderate. They should have their license taken away. You know, and so what you're doing is you are attributing their behavior of pulling out in front of you as an internal factor. They're a jerk. They don't know how to drive. You know, they're, they're inconsiderate. You know, you're not thinking about external factors. You're only thinking about those, you know, that person's a jerk and they're just doing that because they're an idiot, right? They don't know how to drive. Now, what we tend to do is commit another error, okay? So the fundamental attribution error is when we take other people and we don't, usually it's people we don't know, usually or don't like, and we attribute those, in, those behaviors that they have to internal personal factors, okay? Ignoring situational factors. The actor observer bias is when we do the opposite to ourselves. Let's say we're driving down the road and we pull out in front of somebody, but it was an accident. You didn't see them coming or you, you know, thought they were going slower. You're like, oh my goodness, okay, I'm, oh, oh crap, I did that. It's not because I'm a jerk or I don't know how to drive. It's just because I didn't know they were going that fast. I didn't see them because the bush was in the way. I'm, I'm in a really big hurry. So it's attributing our own behaviors to external factors. So, so okay, we jumped out in front of them. It wasn't because of you know an internal factor of we're a jerk. It's because it's, you know, situational factors. And we underestimate or ignore those internal factors. And we're only going to focus on why we did it. Well, that, well, I had a justification. I had a reason for it. So we tend to make this error with ourselves, right? Um, or this have this bias with ourselves because we, it, it is a human nature to not want to think that you're a bad person. Okay. Human nature is that you want to be good and you want to be perceived as good. And so we commit this, this bias because we don't want to be, we don't want to perceive ourselves as being a bad person. So we attribute these kinds of behaviors to external forces. And then what we tend to do to insulate ourselves is things like blaming the victim. Now, if you haven't heard of Elizabeth Smart, this is a really, really interesting case. She was actually kidnapped when she was young. Um, and uh, she was held at knife point and she was kidnapped for several months um, and held hostage, really. Um, and a lot of people blamed her and said she could have gotten away. You know, they said, oh, you know, she, she did something to warrant this kidnapping. It was her fault. And that's insulating because you don't want to think that it could have happened to you. This girl was in her bedroom asleep in her room. She was a child. You know, she, was, uh, she was younger. She was 12 when she was kidnapped um, by knife point. Her, uh, her kidnappers like raped her, um, beat her, and, and uh, abused her, and threatened her, and threatened that they would kill her family if she tried to get away. Um, and she eventually was found um, and, and rescued. But, you know, people actually blamed her and said it was her fault. She should have been able to prevent it or run away or avoid it. And so, you know, when we look at something like hindsight bias, well, that opportunity, she could have gotten away. That opportunity, you know, in hindsight, we'll refer to as hindsight as 2020, you know, of course we can think back and think of all the great things now that we know the truth and, the, and what happened and what was there. And so when we consider blaming the victim, we do this for rape victims and sexual assault victims. Oh, she shouldn't have been wearing that. She shouldn't have been going to the club. She shouldn't have been dancing. She shouldn't have been provoking people. We, it's insulating to us because we think, well, I don't wear stuff like that and I don't go out and I don't drink and I don't whatever. So that can't possibly happen to me. And it's, and it's really a dangerous thought process because it can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter what you wear or what you, how you act or whatever. And blaming the victim is just a way for us to protect ourselves. Um, when we think about attitudes in social psychology, we think about, um, how do, how do you think about things from your, I, from your opinions on ice cream to, uh, how you feel about the social unrest of to society today, to how do you feel about guns, to how do you feel about, um, 
abortion, to how you feel about anything. Everyone has opinions about things. Um, and some people have more opinions and more attitudes about certain things because they know more about it or they're more emotional about it or they have you know ties to it. Um, and then sometimes we don't have really strong attitudes because we aren't as educated or we just don't, we don't care as much. But when we think about an attitude, it has three major components. The affective component, which is how you feel emotionally about it. Your behavior, how do you act, your actions regarding that particular thing, topic, situation, whatever. And cognition, how do you think about this thing? What are your thoughts on it? And so every um, kind of attitude has these major components. So this is a particular good example about Jill and her attitude about fast food restaurants. And here you can actually see her three components, her cognitive components or beliefs and thoughts. You know, um, what does she know about the facts of fast food? And then she has an emotional component about how it makes her feel. I think it's gross. I think it's disgusting. And then this behavioral component is how does she act on that attitude? Well, she actually goes and organizes a petition to uh, make sure that fast, those fast food restaurants don't come in her neighborhood. So these three components of attitudes drives how we think about things, how we, you know, how we act upon um, our opinions. And we also t tend to find that, you know, when we know more about attitudes, a lot of times we know more about how to change a person's attitude because in social psychology, if you take the, the main class, what you'll find is that there's a lot of strategies that advertisers use to play into the emotional, the cognitive, the behavioral opponent in order to change a person's attitude. Now, remember in psychology, and this is something that I kind of um, breezed over, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood. In psychology, the word affect actually means emotion. So if you see affective or affect, I'm referring to the emotional side of things. So that's why it's the ABCs of, of attitude. And then here it says emotional component, but that's affective component. So just want to kind of clarify that. Now, we do tend to categorize people. And we do tend to form opinions and form attitudes. Like I said, remember attitudes broken into three components, okay? We form these attitudes about groups of people. And sometimes we can form a negative attitude toward a specific social group. And that's referred to as prejudice. We actually experience prejudice. Now, if you really study prejudice, you can actually see that there can be um, you can actually develop attitudes that are positive, but you're still categorizing them and you're prejudicing them in a positive light. So let's say you have a really, uh, you have a positive prejudice towards cops, meaning that you uh, might um, look at them more positively than other groups. Um, but we're gonna stick to prejudice right here because the term is described in the book as a negative attitude. We're just gonna, we're, even though I, I just kinda wanna bring up that you can have this idea, this sort of positive attitude about people, and it's also referred to as a positive prejudice, we're gonna talk about prejudice in this case as a negative thing. So this is taking a group of people and having a negative attitude. And so when you uh, have a prejudice against a particular group, a lot of times what we find is that it's split into races so um, or ethnic groups. And you say, well, I don't like this particular ethnic group. What we find is that, um, you know, a prejudice can occur in any kind of social group, any kind of thing that you can, you can separate somebody, you can actually prejudice them. Um, you know, eye color, hair color, you can, any kind of external feature, um, any kind of social group you can group together. Um, nerds, cheerleader, jock types, these are all you can, you know, experience prejudices against any of these sort of categories. What we find is that most people tend to be a lot more alike than different. And if you get a group of people together who are the same ethnic group, there's actually much more differences inside that ethnic group than all the ethnic groups compared to each other. So if you take one group of people together and you only look at these people, they tend to be actually much more different internally than if you were to group all of the groups together. Um, so we're a lot more alike group-wise, then we are different. Stereotypes, okay, these are things that can be um, defined by particular characteristics. So prejudice is, you know, usually when we look at social groups together and, you know, having a negative attitude. Stereotypes are any particular characteristics that can 
um, a category that can be defined by a particular objective characteristic. So objective is something that you can measure and see. Age, language, religion, national or regional origin, tribe, ethnic group, sexual orientation, skin color. This is more of where we see the stereotyping of the jocks versus the, the, um, the uh, you know, nerds versus the cheerleaders. So we can actually have stereotypes. These are the category, the social categories that we define. Um, whereas prejudice, this is that negative attitude, right? Stereotype is that social categories that we define with those particular characteristics. So we tend to sometimes um, include a quality that's just completely unrelated and it has nothing to do with the person. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna to apply to every single person of that particular category. And they're based on this assumption that everyone in that group is, is alike. And like I said before, when you look at people and groups of people, they tend to be much more different internally than across the group. Now, this is a natural thing that we do. It's a natural categorization that we do. And like I said, it's not necessarily it's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that this is a natural cognitive process that we use in order to streamline information. Social information that we get is intense and a massive amount of information. You know, looking at a person, understanding that you have to think about all their physical characteristics, including their personality, what they're saying, what they're doing, how they're behaving, how they're acting. If you can categorize them into a particular group, that saves you time because you think, well, everyone in that group acts this way. And so what it is, is it's making it easier for you to be able to think about that person um, in a quicker way. So it's not necessarily, it's a good thing when you consider that it helps to streamline information, but we tend to make a lot of mistakes and cause a lot of harm when we stereotype people. Now, how do we get from stereotypes to prejudice? It really comes from this idea of in-group versus out-group. So our in-group is, these are the people, this is the social group in which we feel like we belong. Okay, so it could, we have several different in-groups. We could have an in-group that is based off of color. We can have an in-group based off of what we do. So um, maybe the fact that you're a college student, you um, really uh, connect with other people who are college students. Maybe, you know, as age, you connect with other people that are a particular age. Uh, you connect with people who are from Appalachia. You know, all these different things happen. Um, and, and can be separated into in-group. And we tend to have a bias toward our own in-group and that you attribute all their, you know, you, you, may, you have favorable attributions to that particular group. You tend to like them better. You tend to make excuses for them. Um, and then we also experience something called ethnocentrism, which is a type of, of in-group bias, which is basically your culture is better than everyone else's. Um, and I think, you know, many people have this sort of, pretty much everyone has this element of thinking that their own culture is, is the one that is right and the one that's the best. You know, we all sort of have that um, implicit idea within us. Um, and then, so if we have an in-group, of course, we have an out-group. We have all the other groups that we don't belong to. And so we, uh, it might be, you know, age-related, it might be, you know, career-related, it might be um, education, it, it could be fa not family, it could be any sort of uh, out-group. Um, this is just one that you don't feel like you belong to, one you don't connect to. And we also see this idea of out-group hom homogeneity, which is you see that everyone in the out-group is all the same. Right, everyone's similar to each other, but as I've said before, we find that's actually not the case. Of course, stereotypes can be obviously very, very problematic. Um, sometimes we don't even know how we got to a particular stereotype. It can negatively impact a performance, which we refer to a stereotype threat. Um, it, and uh, I'll give you guys an example of a stereotype threat. So um, one thing, one particular stereotype is that Asian people are super intelligent and that they are um, really whizzes at math and they're really smart and you know they are super successful blah, blah. well an, an Asian uh, child who is a child who's Asian might experience this idea of stereotype threat maybe they're not top of their class maybe they're not the best at math and so they feel a lot of pressure to perform and because of that it might give them anxiety and they may actually perform worse because they have this expectation that they're supposed to do better we also find this in for example 
Um, if, a, if, if a boy is African-American, he's expected to be able to play basketball really well. Maybe he can't play basketball. Maybe he's not very good at it. And people are, are saying, oh, well, you know, here, give him basketball. He should be able to play. And then he tries to play. He's not very good. And that's a lot of pressure on him. And that can also um, can, can uh, uh, damage his self-esteem. Stereotypes are really hard to shape. Once you kind of hear one, it sticks. And, you know, I'm sure you can think of a lot of different examples. Um, they can be damaging and misleading. And then um, whenever uh, uh, there's evidence that contradicts a stereotype, um, you know, of course, there's exceptions that can be made. And so um, this, this is an example uh, that I'm not sure if this one's in your book, but it's a really it's a really good example of this idea of of how uh, that um, exceptions can be made <clears throat> when contradictory evidence is present. So there was a study that was done on policemen, and um, the uh, the thing was was that the policemen were um, asked about women, police women. And can they do their job? And, and so the men who were police were asked this. And, and so many men reported they didn't feel that women could do their job. They didn't think they were strong enough. They didn't think they were fast enough and smart enough. And they had all these stereotypes when it came to women, police, uh, uh, police women. So then the study uh, continued and they thought, okay, well, what we're going to do is we are going to um, pair up a man who's a policeman um, with a woman who's a policeman and we're going to have them work together and that way they can the the man can see how well the woman performs well the funny thing that happened was is after they spent several uh, weeks together the men were then questioned again if they felt that women could do the do the job as well as men and the men said no and so they said they didn't think that the women could do, that women in general could do a better job. But then they were asked, well, what about your partner? And they would say, well, but my partner is an exception to the rule. They don't count. And so <laughs> what they ended up doing is even when they had contradictory evidence to their own stereotype that, that was you know, prevalent, they, they thought, well, no, this person is not like those other ones, and it only applies to this one person. So breaking stereotypes requires a group, groups of people, lots of exposure to contradictory evidence in order to not make that, that issue of acceptance. Now, when it comes to um, how you think about things and how you, how you view people, okay, I said before that when we have these implicit cognitions, these, these ideas that we have that we can't really put into words, these the focuses that um, we don't even know that we have, we, we, we can attribute this also to uh, forming attitudes and we do call them implicit attitudes. Now, this is kind of, this is actually older information here where it says psychologists psychologists believe that overt forms of prejudice have been replaced by more subtle forms of prejudice i'm actually going to to uh to go back on this statement and say that um there has been in the current situation today 2018 i will say that up until um this point psychologists have been saying for the past few years that this idea of overt forms of prejudice, overt forms of racism, people yelling things, saying things out to people in public and saying things to their face. We thought for a period of time that that was more, that that, that has been occurring less and that more subtle forms of prejudice, which refer to things like microaggressions and um, sort of what we refer to covert prejudice is occurring. Um, Today, I would say that that is sort of reversing and that we're seeing a lot more overt prejudice, overt racism, overt aggression, overt um, acts um, today. There's been a lot of recent, you know, very uh, racial discourse in our country. And um, for a while, psychologists were saying it's more subtle now. And now I think it's reversing and there's a lot more overt racism that we see. Um, and 
when you talk about the subtle forms though, things like microaggressions, um, little statements that people say that they don't even realize that, um, that they're, that they're not even aware that they're, they're making, like, I'll give you guys an example. Um, a friend of mine has a daughter who is mixed race. Um, and she got the compliment from somebody who said, wow, your daughter has really beautiful hair for a black girl. So the for a black girl <clears throat> is what we refer to as sort of a microaggression or, you know, subtle racism. Um, you know, instead of saying she has beautiful hair, you know, end period and a statement, um, you know, to continue on to say for a black girl is, you know, a racist statement. So, you know, that's more of a subtle sort of, you know, they didn't realize that they're being racist for that one being racist. Um, but when we think about our implicit attitudes, okay, this would be something like, these are automatic, unintentional, hard to control, hard to, to put into words. You know, you have a person, let's say walking down the street, let's say it's a white person and a black person, and white person's walking straight and a black person's coming toward them. The white person doesn't even realize it, but starts to cross the street just to not cross the black person. And they don't even think about it. Like they didn't even realize they did it. That would be an implicit attitude. Um, something that's just so automatic, so unintentional. Um, another uh, set of implicit attitudes that we, that we talk about in, in research that has uh, gotten a lot of, of work recently in, in, in the past couple of decades is the studies that have been done using policemen as well as, uh, or police uh, people, and um, looking at, and, and college students and, and the public as well, is um, seeing how people react to uh, if a white person has something in their hand versus a black person has something in their hand. There have been studies that have, been sh that have shown that when um, a person feels threatened, they tend to act more quickly to shoot um, a person who is black versus a person who's white. So they're gonna be more quick, they're gonna be quicker to pull the trigger a black person versus a white person, even if the black person is not carrying something threatening. And this, these studies have been done over and over and over and over and over again. And what we, and we find that these are implicit actions. So the fact that you just a hair quicker, um, you know, might react to one color versus another color person, these are implicit things. You don't have time to stop and think. You don't have time to sit and say, should I or shouldn't I shoot them? You know, the, think of it like a video game. The studies are done where, you know, you press a button and that button would be to, to shoot them or to, to you know, to react. Um, and so these, these studies have been done over and over and over again. And, and that's why a lot of the argument has been that um, policemen need to be trained about implicit attitudes and trained out of the implicit attitudes because reactions are so ingrained that it could harm society. And so um, when we are thinking about the training of, of like in police academy, understanding what implicit attitudes are and understanding how to, how to combat them, it's very difficult. How do you measure something that you can't verbalize? How do you measure something you don't even know you have? Well, it's very difficult. And on here, there's a link. It's called the Implicit Association Test. Um, and it's, it's not perfect, um, but it's something. It gets to the, to what, what, it gets to the idea of implicit attitudes. And so you can kind of see um, how you, uh, like, what degree you associate particular groups of people, and that's your implicit attitude toward that particular group of people based on their attributes or characteristics. And so the idea is, is the more people that we can um, educate on implicit attitudes, the more we're able to think about what we're doing and actually control them and potentially fix them in, in, in each other, um, in ourselves. And so that's just the whole idea behind it is let's just educate everybody on this idea of implicit attitudes. And hopefully we can kind of recognize when we're behaving a certain way and realize, okay, where's that coming from? Now, how do we fix prejudice? How do we fix this? Um, the idea is that um, we fix it by 
having an opportunity where we all work together. This kind of stems from the Robbers Cave experiment. The Robbers Cave um, State Park in Oklahoma um, in 1964, I believe, there was a study that was done um, where uh, there were these two groups of boys. They were taking part in a camp and they had they experienced a rivalry. And so um, these two groups hated each other. They were at each other's throats all the time. And um, they were the scientists actually created a pretty, pretty interesting dynamic between the two groups. And then what they ended up doing is saying, how can we get these guys to get these kids to get along now that we have, you know, essentially um, uh, made them hate each other. And so they, uh, the, since this was like a summer camp, um, what they ended up doing was they destroyed their water, the scientists destroyed their uh, water source for everybody. And so the two groups of boys had to work together to solve this crisis and found that they actually got along really, really well after that. Now, the problem is, is that these, the, the whole, all of the boys were about the same age. They were the same color and about the same socioeconomic status. So, you know, it wasn't like a bunch of poor kids versus a bunch of rich kids. These were, you know, people that were, these kids were homogenous. They were very, very similar. And so we find that it's easier to get a bunch of similar people to get along versus people who have a lot of differences. Um, but it told us uh, some, some really interesting things about how to overcome um, prejudice. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the video right now at conformity and I'm going to pick this up in a recorded lecture since we don't have anybody um, who's watching along. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop it and start it back up. Um, and uh, we will um, resume right at conformity. So this will be split into two videos.